Chapter 2 During the night, Dinky, who was closest to the trail, bellowed at the sound of a crash in the unlit path. An old stone soldier, which had marked the trail for who knows how many years, had toppled over in the downpour. The heavy, weather-beaten stone soldier had succumbed, as in death itself, finger-deep in the wet ground, and created a shallow grave. The startled burrow beast stayed awake for some time, bemoaning his tired feet and pitiful meals. After the fitful night, Randall awoke from his own snoring, though his party remained solidly asleep under cover of mist. The only sounds were the occasional drips of the concluding rain. After waking, Randall stared long at his nearly empty tobacco pouch. Oh, how could I consume so much in one night? He whispered to himself as he folded the pouch. He needed to stand, but when he was upright, he spotted the female from his vision. Her voice clucked. We thought you weren't going to make it. As her clawed forefinger touched Randall's chest. Randall pulled away and rubbed his numb head. His eyeballs painfully moved inside their sockets. Was he merely dreaming during the day? Never before had a nightly visitor remained so. Drink, his apparition said. Her cupped hand dripped with water close to Randall's mouth. The water came from the storm's runoff, but Randall had no faith in her. She gestured a second time for him to drink. In vain, he smelled the wetness, unable to move his tongue. The dregs of intoxication had sealed his mouth. Open, she gently commanded. Her fingers wetted his mouth and forced the moisture onto the tip of his tongue. In response, his mouth moved. The strange woman espied her minor success, and, for the next minute, she worked more water into Randall's mouth. You have eaten your tobacco, but for a small scraping it is all gone. She answered Randall's question that he was unable to ask. Randall's stomach burned as nausea rolled him over, and then, to one side, he heaved its contents. There was his sinister answer, and he fainted. At the end of two weeks, as his health slowly improved, Randall reached Timberline. After feeding his stock, he ate his small lunch of boiled whole oats mixed with dried salted seaweed, and afterwards waited for his meal to settle. Few trees appeared. Short pines, white birch, bristle cones, and the bravest, the exposed subalpine firs which grew as stunted crumholtzes in the gales. Bare-faced boulders displayed themselves in the open, thin cover. Uneven patches of unmelted snow tucked themselves behind large rocks where the sunshine never shone. Randall's river companion, the Magda, wound along a perilous path below. Soon he would arrive above its fountainhead, a mesh of brooks that gurgled over smooth stones and sandy bottom. The upper derived its flow from the melting snows, but the lower received its water from invigorating heady springs rising out of the ground. However, his path above the Magda, Randall worried, guaranteed none. Shortly, he spoke with deliberation to the pack animals. We'll have to do without so much water, Pinky unerringly groaned in reply as if he understood Randall's bulletin. Traveling far with much time for thought, Randall had discovered that his novel freedom from his family and the chores of his business was pleasant. That variety in the mountains, not seas, stirred him. He also realized that he must make haste to reach the two nights and a possible cure. For the animal woman, he called her, repeatedly materialized even though by morning, as the dew on the pale, she would vanish. Indeed, a malignant madness crawled about the edges of his mind. Dreams pushed their way into his reality, and insanity outpaced him.
Joran Herpedros made his way down the path from Jan Bismra, his summer home, to gather more food from his fields. Recently he had developed a large hunger for kettle greens, which were in full leaf. From his gardens, located on a southerly aspect high above the Tizri Trail, Herpedros could survey the serpentine magda below. As he approached the edge, he spotted the tourists, that is, Randall and his motley crew. Visitors were rare, yet from the traveler's current location, none could spot the hermit. With long, steady strides along a covered path, Turan reached the orchards and green rows, picked enough for two meals and left. He was sure he had escaped the stranger's attention. Indeed, Randall had been too busy persuading his tired band of reluctance up the slope and had failed to notice the lone figure walking the ridge above him. Traveling grew more difficult, but it was hardest on Randall. The stubborn animals, unused to long distances and rough terrain, discerned the scarcity of food. The higher they traveled, the less fare there was to forage. Perhaps he had made a costly mistake in his selection of beasts, dear enough to lose the whole trip. His camel was not used to the cold nights, and Dinky appeared entirely unfit for the steep inclines, as he was the size of a small house. The burrow beast's constant complaining, too, became a nuisance. Each day Randall's strength thinned, as did the atmosphere. Furthermore, loneliness in the vast mountains, combined with anxiety over his own mental stability, disrupted his peace. Red-faced with heat and frustration, disgusted with his animal's growing stubbornness, Randall plopped down on a pile of trail dust and cursed aloud. By east, you're nothing but a bunch of worthless dregs. After a bit of thought, still frustrated, he shouted again. And we're behind schedule. The cursed snow will come before we've had a chance to return from the balm. Dinky bawled with discontent, and Randall lost his last measure of patience. He jumped up and in two steps was at Dinky's side with one foot in the back part of his hindquarters. Dinky, unused to a beating, he was Randall's father's property on loan for the trip, made no bones about his aversion to mistreatment. Although the kick's effect was much like a mosquito's bite, the massive beast bellowed his dissatisfaction and in one commanding jerk loosened the load that Randall had strapped on him that morning. Pans and goods flew in four different directions. Randall's eye closely followed one heavy pan as it cruised past his head. When he fell onto the ground to miss the missile, Randall landed on a sharp piece of granite and tore a hole in his hand. When Randall straightened up, Dinky was nowhere to be found. Ah, oh, shite, great, he said to himself, holding the bleeding hand. Fortunately for Randall, Dinky had discarded his entire load of cookware and foodstuffs. Randall briefly repented of his anger and stupidity, but did not forgive Dinky's predisposition to bemoan everything in life. To pass through his rage and await the return of the cranky burrow beast, Randall pitched camp on a suitable flat shelf of granite in the vicinity of Dinky's departure. Once he fed his camel and carefully cleaned his wound, Randall scoffed down a quick meal of cold rice and herbs and rested on a level stone, one of the many fallen stone soldiers. The cold of the evening forced him to build a fire with a small store of sapporo roots that he had previously gathered. He stuffed a sack that Dinky had expelled, which held his cooking utensils, with pulled moss to sit upon. He placed to his side, some distance from the fire, a bowl of roasted oats to serve as a fragrant enticement for Dinky's return once his temper cooled. The caramelized oats would serve as a sweet welcome home present.